Hello and welcome to today's live stream. We're excited to talk about some Sony lenses today. So get your questions ready for our friendly tech rep, Bear. He'll be able to answer any questions that you have on E-Mount. While we're waiting for that, while we're watching this awesome roller coaster, do me a favor and let us know where you're joining from. That means we are kicking off another week of live streaming every day here at noon Eastern Standard Time. If you could do me a favor, let me know where you're coming from, whether it's Facebook, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Australia or right here in Northeast Ohio. Let me know where you're joining from. Less than two minutes to go. Let me know where you're joining from. We want to hear. It looks like we have uh, just under 15 people in the live stream. So let me know where you're joining from. Hello, 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 and good morning. I hope you guys had an awesome weekend. I hope you guys photographed some cool stuff. It was great weather on Saturday to get some shooting on it. I know I went and found a uh, bald eagle's nest and shot that this weekend. Uh, but what did you guys shoot? 
Let us know in the comments what you guys were out photographing this weekend. I would absolutely love to hear it. And that'll actually go along with our contest, which I'm going to announce a little bit later in the show. So today we're actually going to talk to uh, someone we've had on the show already once before, and today he's going to talk about just a little bit of a different subject, and that is our friend Bear. So let's get him in the screen and see what he has been up to. How are you today, sir? Good afternoon, Teej. I am doing great. And did I hear right? You shot a bald eagle's nest? That just no, 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 no. I photographed it. I photographed Much it. better. Nowadays, you know, you just got to be careful what you say. But cool. That is awesome. You got something like that as subject matter. That's one of my favorite animals of all time. So, but Absolutely. no, I just, uh, you were lucky. Our, the weather here in the suburbs of Chicago, it was kind of bad this past week. It wasn't great. Uh, but today it is absolutely gorgeous. So thank God that I am, uh, you know, got you guys for an hour. And then my work day is done in a few hours. And guess what? It's grab a lens and see what I can go find and shoot. So. I photograph, love photograph. Jeez, I photograph. just pulled a geo and I just said it myself. <laughs> I know. We get into that <laughs> habit too, where it's we like, do. we just say we we're going to go shoot this or shoot that. So I'm trying to do, you know, New Year's resolution just to be better at that. So what are we going to be talking about today? Tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Let's talk about lenses. That's um, one of the big key things is that, uh, you know, you can't, you know, create a photograph without a lens. And some of the things is like in the early days uh, when Sony got into the camera uh, business, it's like they inherited all the technology from Minolta when they bought their photo division back in 2006. And then when we went with mirrorless, um, back in like around 2000 and 2010, very beginning 2011, you know, we started off with a few lenses and over the last nine years have expanded on that and especially over the last seven years with our full frame line of lenses so it's just you know just showing what we've been doing and how you know we really are taking this seriously and realize it's like you know what you can't create an image without a lens and we have different solutions for you Excellent. That's awesome. So before we jump into that, I do want to do just a little bit of housekeeping, if you will. Uh, number one, we are going to be, or we are still open here at the store. So every day but Sunday from one to five, we are here if you need to pick something up. So all you have to do is come up to the front, give us a call, and we can bring your goods out um, to your car. You don't even have to exchange anything. You just pop your trunk and we can put it in there for you. Uh, so just give us a call if there is something you need. A lot of people have been taking advantage of that, and we thank Thank you so much for you know supporting your local store at this time we really appreciate it also uh, we will be doing this live stream every day at noon so if you do have any questions please feel free to reach out and let me know but also if you have suggestions for uh, future live streams unless unless it's get a different host because that's not happening people I am the one and only the fun and only so just let me know if there are topics that you want me to cover in the future and I can make sure that I make that happen also, I wanted to let you know, uh, the PPA, the Professional Photographers of America, have extended their access, their free access to photographers, all photographers, for the month of May as well. So if you are looking for some free online high quality content to get your learn on, I definitely urge you to take a spin over to the PPA's website at ppa.com slash in it together and access all of their free content. Again, this is something that's normally behind a 30 to $40 paywall a month. So Take advantage of this time, learn something new, sharpen those skills. Also, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go to social.thepixelconnection.com and where you see that little iTunes link, we launched a new podcast all about starting your photography business and we would love it if you would subscribe. So again, if podcasts aren't your thing, I get it, uh, but we are trying to get the word out about this podcast. So if somebody you know is getting ready to start their photography business, then definitely get, share this link with them because we think it's super beneficial. And this isn't you know a podcast in which you know we're selling you anything at all. We don't even talk about products. We talk about the business of photography. It's me and another local photographer. And the idea is you could start at episode one and build your business with us at each and every, we do it every two weeks. So the first five episodes are up there. The sixth episode is going live this week. So we would absolutely love your support. So what are our goals for today? Number one is to pull you away from the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that is going on in the world uh, with the pandemic, everything going on, um, to pull you away from that just for about an hour every day at noon where we can hang out. It's like it's like we're coming together and we all work in the same place and we're hanging out at the cafeteria, catching up, talking about our favorite hobby, which is photography and videography. So please join us every day at noon. But my goal is to 
get you away from that fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Number two is to get you motivated to try something new. Maybe you didn't know what lenses were available for the E-mount line. You were unsure which one to pick up when you want to start food photography. Whatever that might be, my goal is to get you to try something new or have a different thought process that you haven't considered in the past. And then finally, help you hopefully discover a new niche. So now, you know, what tools are available to you to start in that niche? You know, maybe you want to start doing you know, product stuff or headshot photography, you know, my goal is to get you into that niche so that way you can be more successful in your business. And then as always, just shoot me an email if you need anything, social at thepixelconnection.com and I'll be able to get you taken care of. So let's swing over here. I want to see who is joining us today. We have our friend, Jim Summers. Hello, Jim. Hope you, hopefully you had a great weekend out there in sunny Wadsworth. Nick Corey's joining us. Hello, Bear. Hey, Nick. And TJ. Well, thanks for that. I'm <laughs> hoping that's a positive thing. Uh, Jim wants to know, which nest were you at, TJ? I spent seven hours watching and shooting one on Saturday. I am so jealous of your photos. Like, you have such amazing photos of the, I believe it's pronounced Eaglette, um, and the eagles that you've been posting, Jim. I absolutely love that. I was down in Ashland right off of Route 30. Uh, so that's where I was um, photographing from. Hello, Karna. I hope you are doing well. If you could do me a huge favor, I meant to reach out on Friday, but shoot me an email at social at the pixel connection.com. So that way I can get you that gift card that you won. Congratulations. And hello, Melissa. I hope you are doing well. I hope you had an awesome weekend. You and the family had an awesome weekend. So you guys didn't come here to hear me talk. You came here to hear Bear talk. So let's get him added in here. We'll get his presentation up on the screen and we are all set to go. I'll turn it over to you, Bear. Bob, thank you very much and welcome everyone. It's so nice to see some repeat people like Jim and Karna and welcome Nick and Melissa. I'm glad to have you guys here. Thank you so much. So what we're gonna talk about today are some lenses and what Sony brings to the table in the lens. But before I begin, let's make sure this goes off without a hitch. And let's do this. See if this thing runs. Is the sound coming through? No, I was just going to say it wasn't. So let's narr narrate this a little bit. Um, sure. So let's talk about some of these things that we're seeing here, because I'm seeing a couple things. Um, number one, a ton of variety in the lenses. I'm seeing long lenses. I'm seeing short lenses. I'm seeing people backpacking. So I have to assume that there are you know, a lot of different lenses in the lineup, and that's what this is showcasing. Absolutely. So, so sorry that the sound didn't come through, and I was testing this morning. It went fine. Always something, right? It's a Monday, right? It's just a Monday. <laughs> uh, if that's the worst thing that happens, I think we're doing just fine. So yeah, it's it, that was something that Sony put together uh, a few months back about you know encouraging people to you know be bold, be passionate. Uh, and be alpha, you know, it's kind of, it's been with a tagline we've been using for um, about a year and a half now. Uh, and it says, see right here on my t-shirt too, uh, is be alpha. It's just like, you know, be bold, do your, do your own thing. You know, uh, TJ kind of mentioned about finding your niche and I, I highly encourage that you try at uh, different genres of photography, you know, find out what calls to you and then, you know, you know, find that passion, explore it. And then keep it fun. Um, I think I used. Uh, I think I used last time we were talking about. Uh, Mark Twain had a quote that said, "Make your vocation a vacation, and you never work a day in your life." Um, there are days that I, I feel like I haven't worked in quite a few years, and there are other days it's just like I feel like it's an indentured servitude. But I love what I do, and by doing that, I just you know have a lot of fun. So. 
again, just kind of re recap from uh, the last time I was out two weeks ago, the, the Alpha Universe um, as a great resource for information on products, not only our cameras, but our lenses as well. Uh, and also inspiration from our artisans of imagery, our image collective. Uh, you can use that as a link to, you know, find firmware updates and all, all that fun stuff. So. So this time, uh, if you uh, hear from the last class, I had a different uh, screen grab for the Alpha Universe uh, front page. This one I decided to grab was lenses, as you can see. Uh, you know, I've got ones that, you know, and this is one of, I want to say at least four or five pages. I mean, it, it goes pretty deep. Uh, you get, uh, you know, talks from Miguel Quiles, who was on, uh, I believe it was last week uh, with, uh, with TJ and uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, you know, he talks about, you know, five things not to do as a portrait photographer, you know, some of his favorite lenses. You know, you've got lenses for landscape. Uh, Carolyn Jensen, who has got, you know, talks about macro. So it's just finding the right solution uh, for what you want to do. So just kind of talk about that. Kind of going back to some of the stuff that I've shot in the past, uh, I was trying to find some other images and I realized I have a couple of them already in the presentation. I just want to be redundant. Um, like still some of my favorites using the one of the cat was actually shot with a macro lens, was with a 90 macro. And he just kind of jumped in on that one. That's Murphy, by the way. Uh, and he was watching me shoot the dead flower as my subject matter. And he kind of came up and did what you saw right there. And I had the, the camera lens on a tripod because I was just, you know, staying stationary on it because I wanted a critical focus. And he started to chew on the flower. So I had to take it away from him and just kind of reset up a couple times. But that is probably my favorite shot. And that was with a 90 macro lens. Just goes to show you, you don't have to use a macro strictly for macro. Um, the beast one right there was probably the 70 to 200, uh, the self portrait just underneath the beast was with the 85, one G master, uh, the ones of the young ladies, uh, Amy in the center, uh, was done with the 85, the one of, um, Jessalyn on the right, the bride, she was shot with the 135, one eight. Uh, and then the other ones, uh, the two top dancers, one was with the 24 to 105 F4. The other was with the 2472 a G master. And then the one at the, the bottom of the screen was done with the 100 to 400, uh, G master lens. So, you know, I will use my lenses as I see fit and cause they're the tools to get the job done. Um, so. If you've ever noticed, Sony actually has multiple lines of lenses in the E-mount series. Uh, we have is technically kind of four, uh, but we these are the three we usually focus on, and we have Sony lenses that are not designated with a G, a Zeiss, or a GM. Um, so the, those ones that aren't, there's still Sony lenses that were not designated uh, with anything additional uh, are usually kind of like our kit lens, like the 1650 power zoom, uh, the 2870 that you'll find in like the a7 III kit. You know, those don't have any of the designations, but you know, they're, they're affordable lenses and they get you started. Um, that 1650 I've always found to be um, quite impressive, to be honest with you, uh, in the respects of the optically, it's actually a pretty nice lens. It's just, you know, it's not our best built lens and, you know, probably shouldn't really kind of say that out loud, but Anybody who's ever met me, which is most of you as I look who's over here, know that I always call them as I see them. But going back to what we do really showcase is like the G series. Um, that was the nomenclature we inherited from Minolta. Uh, the G actually stands for gold. And it was, at the time, it was Minolta's professional series of lenses. Uh, great sharpness. They were designed by us and made by us. And then we also developed a partnership with Zeiss. Uh, so we design lenses in conjunction with Zeiss, and then we make them to their specifications. So we have the high resolution and the contrast. Uh, you know, it, Zeiss will not let us put that blue symbol on unless we meet their criteria. So and, you know, it's got, we have the T-Star T -Star coated glass. Uh, I have been a Zeiss kid for a really long time uh, in the respects of when I shot Hasselblad, those were Zeiss lenses and I fell in love with them. Uh, it seems like people either fall into, when it comes to German glass, either Zeiss or Leica. I'm a Zeiss kid, love it. And when I got this job, I got to go back to playing with Zeiss again on a different scale. And then the lenses that we design ourselves and we make uh, to a much higher standard than the other two is our G Master series of lenses. Um, they are absolutely gorgeous. Gorgeous. Uh, the, the shot I showed, you know, I, I jokingly call it the self-portrait of that little alien head. 
Um, that was literally the first thing I ever shot with a Sony camera and a lens. Uh, it, it was with the A7R II uh, four years ago with the 85 G Master, and it put to bed any reservations that I had about how good Sony glass was in comparison to the guys from Red and Yellow. And I've been sold ever since. So also two of the Dream G Masters, we've just got those beautiful bokeh. You know, the resolution is ungodly and we'll talk about that a little bit more later down the road. Uh, but that's where you'll find like our 2.8 zooms uh, and some really high quality ones like 1.8s and 1.4s as well. So don't forget to pop some questions into the, the comments too. And uh, we'll definitely take them at the end, but I know TJ every now and then will pop in if he's got a, a question uh, or a comment to go with. So please don't be afraid. Absolutely. To... So what is the T-Star coding? The T-Star coding is, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Zeiss glass, uh, Zeiss is, Carl Zeiss uh, has been around for, been making lenses for over 125 years. Uh, they are one of the premier lens manufacturers in the world. And part of it's like their coatings uh, that they put on there for the help give the light transmission and help, you know, keep resolution and uh, kind of like from beginning to end. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. Um, you know, if you have one of our uh, our series cameras, you will notice that you'll see that little T-star symbol right there, the red T in the, the asterisk. Let you know that's what's in the electronic viewfinder glass to help you see, oh, so wow. make sure you can see it. Yeah, so we we have this beautiful partnership with them, and um, and it, it, they, I love to see the gang from Zeiss. We all get along so well. Uh, but I think, as you said, we've had this discussion last time. It's like you know we all see each other, and we just it's road family, and we all care, and we all bring something to the table, and we just enjoy each other's company, which is awesome. Actually, awesome. I love it. Yes. Question so far. Oh, cool. All right. So some of the things that we're going to go over today is the e-mount system itself, or we jokingly call it the one mount to rule them all. Uh, the sensor size, focal length, aperture, depth of field and light gathering, primes versus zooms. And it's kind of like saying, you know, uh, taste greater, less filling, or is it chocolate vanilla? Um, but let's get started with the one mount system. So when we came into the camera system itself it's you know it actually the e-mount system came from the video side of things uh because video doesn't need a mirror box um so they were like you know what we can eliminate that size that weight uh and keep things small and just have a better hybridization so with the e-mount system over the years we have built up to now 56 lenses um, that which is incredible. We have the, currently have the largest uh, lens ecosystem for any camera system, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Now, if in the questions you're going to ask me what's coming up next, I have no idea. They tell us nothing. I will find out when a new product is announced when they announce it to the rest of the world. True story. So, you know, if anybody's going to ask about an uh, like you know the a rumored A7S3 or an A7 IV or a new, no clue. Not in on those meetings. So, Absolutely. Uh, and that's one thing too. I can also vouch for at Panasonic. Like they would never tell us until like a week before, even. And even sometimes it was the day of. Like especially like firmware updates and stuff like that. Like we had no idea that stuff was coming down. I say you get a week notice. Uh, I've been lucky if I get a ten minute notice. You know, I think <laughs> the best I've ever gotten was a half hour. It's like, you know, here's what's coming up. And typically that has not been like cameras or anything like that. It's, you know, something like a smaller accessory or uh, you know, a, a good product, but it's not something that might like kind of shake up the industry or create some, some big ripples or waves in it. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, we I did have it. a couple of things come in. First one is, um, what is your relationship to Sigma or do you have a relationship with Sigma? I can't stand any of those guys. They are just awful, <laughs> awful. <laughs> No, some of my well, some of my dearest friends in this industry, one of them actually uh, belongs to Sigma. Um, you know, some of the stuff that happens behind the scenes is, you know, we're not always told what happens on the agreements between with other companies. You know, are they, uh, is the mount system licensed? We're never fully told. But okay. there are third party, you know, lenses that are out there that do create things a bit more affordable as you're getting into the line. And the thing is, you will, you know, you will never hear me speak badly about my competitors. We all right. bring something to the table. Simple as that. I'm going to beat that dead horse every time we talk about it because it is the truth. You know, it's just finding the right fit for you. But, you know, it's, we've we've got great lenses. Everybody's making good stuff. And it's just what's going to work best for you. Yep. So, and there are third-party lenses available. You know, Sigma has some great lenses. Um, so, yes, there is a relationship there in that. And actually, Bear's going to be talking about a lens converter as well that will let you use other glass, and that's made by Sigma. Absolutely. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but I will say that... Um, 
what I do with it. While you're doing that, I wanted to say hello to Claude. He did join us. Um, looks like he's standing there with a cannon, like a literal cannon, not even like a <laughs> photographic. <laughs> hello, Claude. I hope you're doing well over there in Dearborn Heights. Yeah, I had my... Oh, there it is. So this, I'll tell this quick story real quick. We're going to have lens adapters at the end, but I just want to show it to you. The reason I put orange on so I know. This is actually the Sigma MC11. When I came to Sony four years ago, I had, between my red and yellow systems, about 20 grand worth of glass. It's a pretty heavy investment. My heaviest investments were the, were the guys in red. And shortly after I, you know, I started the job, the Sigma rep, uh, whose name is Brian, actually Lindhoff, not Matsumoto, who's the current one, both are great guys. Um, Brian Lindhoff said, hey, he goes, hey, Bear, I know you have a lot of Canon glass. I want you to try this thing out. So he, uh, we were doing a show. Um, he gave me the adapter and said, okay, give it to me next time we see each other. So I had about a month at the end of the month, I gave his back and I bought one and I've had it ever since it was a, cause at the time, uh, we didn't have as much full frame glass as we do now. And, you know, our ecosystem has grown. So it's like the time we didn't have a 7200 2.8. It had been announced, but it had not been released. We didn't have a 1635, you know, a lot of lenses that I had for the guys in red, didn't have an orange yet. Those gaps have been filled, but it was also an easy way for me to talk to customers who are like, well, you know, I have all this glass that's, you know, EF mount, uh, F, uh, but, you know, I don't want to switch over. I'm like, well, hey, here's a $250 solution that you can use until the finances are better that you can make the full transition over. Is what the argument that I can make is that, you know, the lenses, our lenses are designed by us, for us, so you will get the best performance because it's a, it's a complete circle. You know, it's a closed loop system in that respects, but you know, great. I, I, I tease the Sigma guys. I think I've sold more of these than they have because I, I personally own one. I've got skin in the game on it. I don't have to talk nicely about it. I do because it works. And if it didn't work, you wouldn't see it on my table at demos. And TJ, you've seen the, you always seen it on my table at the demos showing, Hey, it works. So absolutely appreciate that. All right. Let's see. Let's get back on here. So as you can see with our e-mount system, it, it covers not only our full frame and our crop sensors, you know, with our camera systems themselves and the full frames, we've got, you know, you know, we jokingly used to call the A7 series our basic system. Once we went from uh, the second generation to the third, we'd made so many adjustments, we really can't call it the basic. It's more of a entry level into full frame mirrorless. Of course, we have our R series, which stands for resolution, which will be our, the highest resolution sensors that we make. S stands for sensitivity, which will have a lower pixel count, but they'll be bigger, so they're better light gathering. So you'll, you know, and the S2 is our most current version of that one, and it is really amazing for those light performance. It is a 12 megapixel camera, and I've had a few people in my time kind of make the comment about, oh, it's only 12 megapixels. My first full frame camera on the guys in yellow was 12 megapixels, and it was, and it did the job exceedingly well still did the good it did, still did a great job just became older technology and then our speed demon and probably the most versatile camera is the a9 series with 24 megapixels up to 20 frames per second up to 204,000 on the iso and just amazing 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 so in our crop sensor series we have uh kind of going back sorry about that uh we've got the a6000 series and even the a5100 all the way or a5000 series all the way on the right now, uh, even goes into our professional camcorders like the FS5s, the FS7s, the FX9. Even our big cinema camera, the uh, the Venice, has E-mount into it. So you can very easily use the lenses that are in the current lineup. And you can adapt not only the E-mounts, but, you know, you can adapt to PL mounts as well, which is, you know, kind of the industry standard. But in a pinch, you've got those. You can use it. It's right there. So being able to mix and match your lenses on the cameras. You know, if we go back to a basic 35 millimeter format, you know, you've got the 35.6 by 23.8, and then your APS-C sensor is, you know, 15.6 by 23.5. So every lens is designed to create an image circle. And that image circle is designed to cover those four corners of those formats. So the downside is, is that, you know, the, if there is really a downside is that when you go to a crop sensor, the crop sensors literally smaller uh, so they don't record as much as lens information from the full frame side so on my uh, final slide right there or the little graphic is that you can see there's the image circle that an fe which stands for a full frame e-mount or as i like to call it 
fits everything. So if you're into the Sony system, if you're worried, you know, what lenses you should buy and you say, you know, in a few years, you're going to go to a full frame camera. If you're shooting a crop sensor right now, um, I always encourage start buying the FE lenses because they will work down the road uh, and they'll go back to their normal angle of view and focal length as you put them on a full frame where on a crop sensor, you'll have a 1.5 crop factor. So if you hate math, which, you know, not everybody loves, uh, if you put a 100 millimeter FE lens on an A7R4, it's the normal angle of view and it's 100 millimeter focal length. Put that same lens on the 6500 or 6600, it sees things as a 150 millimeter lens. So your angle of view narrows down, which is great if you're doing sports or wildlife. Guess what? You know, that 200 to 600 now becomes a 300 to 900 millimeter lens. And it's a $2,000 lens. Makes things a lot easier. So, you know, if you guys like Jim and TJ shooting your eagles and your wildlife, you know, you can't get too close. Guess what? You can step back and zoom in if necessary. So you can put an APS-C lens on a full frame camera. You do get this type of vignetting, but the cameras recognize when you do that and will automatically crop down to where that blue box is at. So you can see, hey, this is what I'm getting. If you want to keep that vignette and do the cropping yourself, you can just turn that off in the menu feature so you will have this vignette like you're looking through like a keyhole. There you go. It's like APS-C to Super 35. Uh, on this one of these cameras, it's a little bit, uh, it's at the top. On the newer cameras, it's usually, I think on the R4 and the 7.3, it's in camera tab one at the very bottom of the first page, if I remember correctly. So I can very easily take care of this. Now, when you do put a crop lens on a full frame camera, you do reduce the resolution that you can use because the image circle is only so big and the camera can only record what falls on the sensor. So a good example is like on the A7R4, it's a 61 megapixel camera when you're using the full frame. When you go to APS-C, it drops it down to 26 megapixels, which puts it at the top tier of crop sensor resolution. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds out of it if you really want to go that route. Um, if you're going to any of the other cameras, say like the A9 or the A7 III, you go from 24 down to 10. Uh, keep in mind is that those pixels are still bigger than the cropped. Uh, please don't ask me what the, the conversion is. I'm sure there is one. Uh, I just don't feel like doing the math right now. Sorry. <laughs> it's a Monday. Coffee hasn't kicked in yet. So another little example here. So like a 70 to 300, a uh, full frame on a crop would be like a 105 to 450. Aperture. We hopefully we all know about apertures. You know, the lower the number, the bigger the opening, lets more light in. The smaller the opening means it has a larger number, and it's all fractional. It's all by a, a like a 1.4. So if we go to a 1, 1, 4, 2, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32, and so on and so on. Um, and as you know, every time we move one stop, either we uh, we're either doubling the amount of light that comes in or we're cutting it in half. So it just kind of depends on what you're working with. You know, the shooting at a wider opening will get you shallower depth of field where a larger number uh, is a smaller opening means you get greater depth of field. So more of the, uh, what you're shooting appears to be in focus and they both have a purpose. Uh, and it's just find out what's going to be, help you tell your story. What's going to, you know, fulfill your creative vision. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit too. So good example here is we got uh, Ben Moon and uh, Bob Christ, uh, two of our artists of imagery. Uh, if you've never met Bob Christ, he is one of the sweetest guys you're ever going to meet. Uh, he comes from a, a different company background. He's now one of ours and I've had the opportunity to work with him and just one of the nicest guys, very, very generous with uh, his knowledge. Um, ben, I've only had the opportunity to meet once and it was just, just a really cool, chill dude. So I just hope to look forward to work with him again. So here, as you can kind of see behind them is that it's very shallow depth of field because the expression and the attention is meant to be on these two artisans. Uh, you know, if you've been doing photography long enough, you can kind of look at the background and get an idea of what's behind them. It looks like there's a bunch of people there about the middle of the frame, right over Bob's uh, left shoulder. Uh, but you know, I'm looking at them and their expressions. The one on the right, you know, at F16, I want that majestic landscape. I want to show off those colors, that contour. You know, I want to see some of that texture that's in that type of a landscape. And just having it, you know, just, you know, create some scale in some respects. Like, you know what? We are very, we're like a flea in that overall image on the right. You know, just for how 
where we fit into the grand scheme of things. Now, this is one of those fun ones. I've had people call it boca, bouquet. And whenever I hear bouquet, it's almost like, what about bouquet? I mean, I mean, the thing you throw at a wedding, you know, at least the bride throws. Um, it's a, a Japanese word for, you know, blur or haze uh, or fuzzy. Uh, you know, it is, you know, bouquet uh, or boca. You know, it's like you think it's like bow is in bow and arrow and K is in kettle. Uh, it means the same thing. It's tomato, tomato, potato, spud. You know, if you say it, anybody who's been in this industry will know what you're talking about. Um, it is very important, especially if you're shooting a portrait. Now, this is an image that was shot with our 8514G Master at F2. Uh, this was actually shot in Las Vegas last year, uh, just before uh, WPPI. Literally the day before WPI uh, opened and the day before we announced the 135 1HE Master. Uh, the shot was taken with uh, me and my team. Uh, some of us got in a little early and hired a model. This is Allie. Uh, and went out to Nelson, Nevada, which is this kind of little ghost town. If you ever have the opportunity to go out and do this, it is amazing. You can shoot mm -hmm. textures, landscapes, portraits. Uh, have you been there, Teach? I'm, I'm watching you nod yep. your head. It's yeah, so that's where my wife and actually my wife and I got married in Vegas, and we actually went out there for our photos, like for our wedding photos. Did you so get married in church, home, Elvis? All, uh, Elvis was not there. Oh, um, you couldn't it was find like, one. It was actually a pretty. It was actually a pretty cool. Um, then we had about twenty-one people come out with us, but we actually got a party bus and took the whole group out to. It's because it's near the Grand Canyon. Um, mm. But yeah, highly urge you to check out Nelson, Nevada. I've been out there. So cool. 10, 15 times just to photograph and you always see something new. So yes, definitely I'm, love I'm amazed. Yeah. We, we went for a few hours and you, you pay to be there and it's not, it's not a, uh, expensive. It's, you know, what you're paying for the time and what you get out of it. Amazing. You know, it is. I want, I, I could lose a couple days there very easily shooting just about everything like macro again, textures, landscape, portraits, the scenery is fantastic. Now, this is with the, the 102.8 STF. Um, at that same location in Nelson with Allie, I did have this lens with me as well because uh, I have a tendency to be a creature of habit and I use what I know. And this is one of those lenses I've played with but I hadn't shot with as extensively. I use this a lot when I was in Nelson uh, and shooting uh, uh, photographing images of uh, Allie. And it was just so so cool. And this is one of those lenses that Miguel Quiles really loves and tells everybody, he goes, you guys are missing out if you haven't shot with this. And he's right. He truly, truly is right. So what's also too, with some of those, with the, the bokeh, uh, is like you're looking at, you know, the harsh, you've got that. If you look at the image on the left, you know, you have nice circles, but if you look, you can see lines inside. Sometimes that's called the onion effect, uh, where on the one on the right with the bird, it's not so smooth. It's more of a blur, which can be, it creates an interesting effect, but it's not gonna work for everything. You know, with the non-circular bokeh, I mean, it's one of the things that we do with ours is that we have like circular shaped shutter blades and we do have quite a few of them. They can be like seven, nine or even 11 blades to help create a nice circular uh, little points of light. Uh, and as you look at the one on the right, you can see that there's less blades. So you get that kind of that almond shaped or football shaped uh, type uh, look. And again, it could work for you. You don't know, but you got to try and play with your gear. You've got to learn what it can and cannot do. So, yeah. And also we do rent out um, the lenses that he's talking about. We do rent those out at the store. So if you want to try before you buy, Absolutely. definitely give us a call and you can, you know, take it out for the weekend or if you have a job, we rent, you know, the full line. So just let us know what you need. And that's, and that's one of the best things that you can do is definitely rent it. That, you know, TJ mentioned, try before you buy. Therefore, you know, say you don't like it. Guess what? you're out whatever the rental fee is, but you know that didn't work for you, or you know that that was the item for you. You know, that's it's pretty awesome. So one of the things we were I was kind of talking about too with the, the G Master lenses, which, you know, we designed ourselves and we make ourselves, and it's held uh, to a very strict standards. Uh, all of the G Master lenses um, have what's called an XA lens element. It stands for extreme, extreme aspherical. Try and say that once on a Monday afternoon. Um, it is polished to 0 0.01 microns. So it is highly engineered and it helps with keeping the lenses such high resolution. Um, if you look at the very bottom of the graphic, you know, you don't have an onion effect. You don't have, uh, you know, kind of 
edges that go out, but also too is an on all G Master lenses. There is a standard for the lines per, per millimeter, so resolution. So at maximum aperture, wide open on every lens, the minimum is 50 lines per, per millimeter. So the 8514G Master, it's at 50. The 7200-2.8, 50. The 100-400 uh, the at f4.5, 50. So that's the bare minimum. And as you start stopping down, it just gets better and better. It's, you know, in the G Master lenses are optimized for the higher resolution sensors. So you can use them on anything else, you know, any of the other cameras with uh, lower megapixels. But, you know, if you really want to you know, maximize the, the, the R-series cameras, G Masters are the best ones to go with. Um, we have the, you know, the Gs themselves, the 24 to 105 is very impressive. It really is. I'm just that, you know, I shoot with the R's so I love resolution and I want to just dial everything. I want the highest resolution lenses with the highest resolution sensor. So therefore, I've got everything dialed in. That's just how I like to shoot, and that's what works for me. You shoot your way. Your photography, your vision, your style, you, are, you do what works best for you. So here a nice shot of the owl at f8. But the key thing is, if you notice here, it's at 560 millimeter lens. So therefore, f8 is going to be a different type of look with a telephoto lens compared to a wide angle lens because you know you, as the, you increase the focal length and the zoom you're, it compresses the background which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, coming up but it's you know it has a different effect just like shooting macro f8 on macro is much different than shooting f8 at like normal distances you know this literally could be the depth of field under f8 about an inch or so depends what lens what you're shooting and if you've never tried this, there's actually a really neat little in-camera special effect that you can do is if you've ever wanted those like those star, uh, like a, a star filter effect, start stopping down the lens. F11, F16, F22. So in, in some cases, uh, if you don't have a filter handy and you want that effect, just do it in lens. But if you have the filter, you can turn all the point light sources into this little sun star or star effect. Also, too, is like when you're shooting on the lower f-stop, it'll let you work in much lower lighting situations, so you don't necessarily have to pump up the uh, ISO to compensate or slow down the shutter. Uh, I've had too many years of sugar and caffeine, so I'm not physically stable, much less mentally stable, so I need all the help I can get uh, with our uh, in-body image stabilization. I, so I try to shoot wide open at times, like this street performer here just banging away on the drums in New York. is like, you know what? I want the emphasis on his expression and that's great now prime lenses now here we get into the fun part of primes versus zooms now with primes you know they're a fixed focal length you know the and some people say, what's the zoom i'm like you are the zoom you either move closer to your subject or you move further away so i usually call it the bipedal zoom uh the aperture value typically it does not change you know whatever your maximum aperture is it is what it is you know you could have a 1.8 or a 1.4 lens. Um, you know, a good example is the 85.18, which is an extremely affordable lens, one of the best bangs for your buck you're gonna find in the Sony line. Thing is amazingly sharp for 600 bucks. And it's a 1.8 lens. Smaller and lighter than our 1.4. Uh, it has less uh, shutter blades compared to the 1.4. Uh, but you know, it's like maybe you're not all using it all the time. It's an occasional thing. 600 bucks isn't bad. Um, and you can still do that 1.8. And with the primes, they are typically smaller and lighter in comparison to zooms because it's designed for that angle of view. Zooms, on the other hand, uh, will have a variable focal length. Uh, we have a 24 to 240, 24 to 105, uh, a, a 70 to 350, uh, you know, 200 to 600. You know, with those, they are built for, built for versatility. Uh, when I was shooting weddings, you know, my the, my main gun, my favorite lens was the 24-70-2.8. Number two was the 7200. Now, if I was trapped on a desert island, if I could only have one lens, it would be 24-70-2.8. You know, just based on the versatility because I've got at least five lenses in there. I've got 24, a 28, a 35, a 50, and a 70. It's, it's just less stuff that I have to carry, less changing the lenses. Um, the downside to zoom lenses is depending on what lens you get, 
you can end up with a variable aperture. You know, maybe it's a 3.5 to 5.6 or a 3.5 to 6.3. So, you know, at the widest angle of view, it's going to be the 3.5. And then as you start to zoom, it becomes that, you know, 5.6 or 6.3. So you're losing typically like a stop, stop and a half of light. You know, with the higher quality zooms, it's constant aperture. So like the 70 to 200. It's 2.8 at 70, at 200, and all points in between. So I can still keep that same amount of light coming in. I'm not reducing the amount of light. Because remember, as I mentioned previously, every time I move the f-stop one, you know, move it one stop, either opening it up one stop or closing it down, I'm either doubling the amount of light coming in or cutting it in half. So I just got to keep that in mind. And if anything, they can be a bit heavier and larger because they are covering a much greater range. And just the laws of physics will kind of determine how big that lens is. Um, a few years ago, I'll tell the story real quick. I was doing a, a demo at one of my stores and a guy come up and said, he goes, what you need to do, which is always a wonderful way to start a conversation, especially with the tone and attitude that he had, was you need to come out with a 24 to 500 millimeter lens that's 2.8 and costs $500. Sat there for a moment and said, you know, that would be a great idea, but the laws of physics would determine that the lens would probably, the front element would probably be this big, and that would be more than $500. Sorry, until we can change the laws of physics, it ain't going to happen. So he just kind of gave me that look and said, well, that's what you need to do. And I do put all, you know, suggestions in my reports. So I sent that one for the engineers to, to have a nice little chuckle about. But yeah, I, I did send that in. It's, just, it's a true. This is what people are asking for. And the nice thing too is uh, one of those things is that if you know you don't have to change lenses that often, uh, every time you don't have to change the lens, you reduce the chance of dust getting into a camera. And that's just not mirrors, that's every camera. Um, and for me, I always tell people when you're changing a lens, and let me grab one. I was gonna save to show this one later, but I'm gonna show it now. Um, I always do it with the lens mount down. So thank you, Teach. And it's a little different when I'm trying to show someone. This is one of those adapters we were talking about. Um, because dust will go left, right, it goes down, but it typically doesn't do one of those. It doesn't kind of drop and then come picking right back up. So that's how I usually do it. But the great thing about mirrorless is if you do have dust on your sensor, you can see it pretty much right away. So you know you gotta be, uh, be careful or blow it off with like a, a, a blower bulb or something along those lines. Focal length. Most consider the 50 millimeter a normal view because uh, the angle of view is really close to the human eye. Some will say it actually falls between the 45 and 48 millimeter, but 50 has been that standard for literally decades, and which is really, really cool. And anything under 50 millimeters is considered a wide angle and everything over, excuse me, has been considered a telephoto. So this kind of, uh, this little shot here at Union Station in, in, uh, in the Denver area, you know, there's your 50 millimeter. There's your 24, there's your 35, 70, 100, 200, and 300. So just doing kind of quick bounce back and forth between the two, there's your 300 millimeter, and there's your 50. Definitely some fun stuff. So all lenses have kind of an angle of view. Uh, this little quick graph will kind of show you what like 18 millimeters and 300. will give you a rough idea of what's in there. Know, what you're looking at and what you're going to be covering. So, you know, depending on what you're trying to do or trying to look you're trying to go with, you know, uh, typically anything, you know, wide angle, like an 18 millimeter uh, and under, is not really good for portraits because you got to get kind of closer to someone to do a headshot and it starts to distort their looks. They start looking like a Muppet. And I've had fun doing those shots, but, you know, it's not something that uh, I would really want to sell to someone because it does not bring, it does not make them look good. Uh, the characteristics of lenses, wide angles uh, are usually when they're parallel to your subject. You typically don't show distortion uh, and they're very clean and they offer like a lot of depth of field uh, in comparison to a telephoto or a uh, even a, a bigger zoom. You know, with the wide angle too, you can start to get, uh, you know, if you start moving the lens, they will call it like uh, pin cushion or barreling. You'll get some distortion. Uh, and also depends on the quality of the lenses to help counteract such a wide angle to keep those lines straight. Objects that are closer to the lens uh, and, the, and the camera itself will appear to be much larger. Um, I've seen it with photographers that are starting out, say they're shooting fashion, and they're doing a wide angle, and they're doing uh, maybe a shot of a model sitting down and where they're at, her legs look like they are like super long 
uh, and just looked a little bit distorted uh, in that respect. So you just have to be careful of using wide angle lenses in the position of your subject matter. Like this one of the hot air balloon looks really, really cool because you've got uh, the, the, the heater right there and then you've got the, the balloon itself. And, with, and typically too with like wide angles, it's like, you know, it will make subjects look further away than, you know, what normal. Uh, it's kind of the reverse of your side mirror. It's like objects in the mirror closer than they appear. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. And with wide angle too is, you know, if you're using a wide angle lens, it's always nice to have something in the foreground to help fill space and, and a lot of times help give some little, help a little more perspective. You know, if you've got, you know, family members and you have a situation like this where you're out in, uh, in nature and you want to show the grand scheme of things, just put someone in there, especially if it's someone everybody knows, they can, they'll have an idea of, you know, how they have an idea of how tall they are and what the rest of the scene looks like in comparison. So that's one of our new one, our 20 millimeter 1.8, which is ridiculously sharp. And it's one of our G series lenses. It is just beautiful. You know, telephoto will actually make, you know, faraway subjects look closer. Cause I mean, the last thing you want to do is like the, you know, when you start dealing with moose and elk, you know, you get too close, they ain't going to like you. And they got them big horns and they'll get you. So, you know, it gives you a run and start. You know, with telephotos as well is, you know, getting shots in golf. Um, you know, typically in situations like this, you cannot start taking pictures until you know, contact is made with the ball. You know, with the A9, it can shoot 20 frames per second silently, so you can actually get him, uh, golfers going through the whole swing. Uh, you may remember a few years ago, Tiger Woods went off on a photographer because he started shooting beforehand, uh, or allegedly started shooting beforehand, and he, I mean, just said some things that he got fined by the FCC, if I remember correctly. And I think the photographer got, you know, pitched for shooting. Um, we also with Telephoto 2, as you may have heard of the uh, kind of like the reciprocal rule. Uh, our artisan Patrick Murphy Racer recommends, you know, the shutter speed at 100 millimeters. Uh, it's where it's like, if I'm shooting with a 100 millimeter lens, I want to set my shutter speed equivalent to the focal length of the lens, which would be like 1 one hundredth of a second. Now, I've always taken it a little further when I'm using the an APS-C camera with a full frame lens. You know, that 100 is now equivalent to 150 millimeter in its angle of view. So I'm going to set it at 1 one fiftieth. And when you start shooting even longer lenses, which can be a little bit heavier, you're going to have to play around and find out what the minimum shutter speed is going to be for you to hand hold, if you are hand holding, and keeping it a steady shot, a nice sharp shot. Couple shots with our 135-18 G Master, uh, which may be the sharpest lens I've ever worked with. It is holy crap sharp. Oh my god! Uh, most people, you can count the, their eyelashes. Me, not only can you count my eyelashes, but you can count the bloodshot in my eyes. Using telephotos for like portraits, as you can see on the far left, uh, the 35 millimeter helps show that like industrial uh, scenery in the background. The 50 has starting to bring it in a little bit and starting to make it a little fuzzier. And then the 200 millimeter just helps you know, draw your attention to the little girl and not so much to the background. And working with portraits which is what I've done for mostly in my career. Um, I've worked with, you know, 70 to, to 135 has been a great focal length for uh, portraits. A lot of people use the 50. Uh, there was a while there that the 50 kind of fell out of fashion. And then when digital came around with that 1.5 crop factor, or 1.6, depending on your uh, manufacturer. You know, now you had like a 75 or an 80 millimeter lens for really inexpensive. So you know, it helped bring that you know the 50, the nifty 50s back into play. But the thing you have to be careful of using, and I kind of mentioned turning people into a muppet, is like using that 24 millimeter in with a subject on the left, where it starts bringing out the cheekbones and the nose. And as you start using a longer focal length, you can see how things start to get back to a normal view. Uh, I love using the 135 now uh, as I've incorporated into my, my shooting because I used to use the 7200 as my favorite portrait lens because of the versatility and it's a 2.8 lens. I, I, sometimes I don't always want too shallow depth of field, um, but it can work. Again, it's just what am I trying to accomplish? Macro lenses, we've got three in our line right now. We've got the 30, 30 millimeter, which is designed for the APS-Cs. Uh, then we have the full frames, the 50 millimeter and the 90. That 90 is incredible it is one of the sharpest lenses on the market and that's not me saying that that's dxo mark saying that it has one of the highest ratings on their website and if you're say you're shooting like insects 
Now you gotta be careful with the 30 and 50 getting too close because then you know your insect could fly away. Uh, with the 90, you, th you, know, you can put the camera in crop mode or use a crop camera and now it's equivalent to 135 millimeter and you just have to physically move uh, closer or further away to get your, your composition. Now, like most states, uh, as we're getting to the point where uh, some states are starting to open up, uh, Illinois is pretty much on lockdown. So, you know, street photography downtown, eh, yeah, you might get arrested at the very least ticketed, uh, no lakefront activity, uh, no sunsets of the skyline, because right now things are quiet. It's like the perfect opportunity, but you can't. So, if you're out for a walk, take your camera. And you'll probably have your smartphone with you as well, but bring your camera with. You don't know what you're going to find while you're out there. You know, you may use, you know, make it, if you're on a walk, you know, and if you have a variety of lenses, challenge yourself on a daily basis. Say, hey, I'm just going to take my 20 millimeter and I'm going to try different perspectives at different angles. I'm going to get low. I'm going to get high uh, on my subject matter. I'm going to move around it and try just different angles and just shoot that way. And then the next day, try a different lens. And if you just, all of you have is zoom lenses, work with one focal area. So maybe you shoot it at the widest angle possible. Next day, it's the most telephoto the lens offers you know you have to challenge yourself you won't know really until you try you can read everything that's out there you can you know watch all of the webinars and use the stuff that you're learning today and the stuff that pixel connection offers with their lunch and learns to, as a kind of something to try find out what works and then get rid of what doesn't you know bruce lee it left and right you know we're living in a time where you know Hope to God in our in our lifetimes we don't have to go through what we're going through now, but it's a perfect opportunity to document and create a little history from your perspective of this worldwide pandemic. So have some fun. Be creative. You know, you got people who are using their smart devices and their laptops to have their meetings with friends. They're celebrating birthdays and uh, anniversaries and, you know, graduations. You know, they're doing stuff, you know, uh, through online, which is kind of crazy. But, you know, we're adapting. You know, it's the old uh, creed of the Knights of the Round Table. Adopt, adapt, and improve. And fortunately, we are going to get through this and we are going to get past this. This, you know, this, uh, this storm of craziness is going to pass. It's going to. And what it does, it's like, you know what? The weather's going to get more nice. Nature's going to go, hey, we're still here. Come and photograph us. Be creative. Use your lenses at wide open and just blur out that background. Use them at a higher aperture so you can get greater depth of field to show like maybe fields of uh, flowers, tulips, you know, lavender. Pictures of family. Uh, one of our uh, artisans, uh, Paul Giroux up in Wisconsin, is doing porch ritz. <laughs> Taking pictures of people from their porch. Or he's out on the street and they're on their porch. It's finding ways to be creative. And with lenses like that, you can do it. Start playing around with light. Because what is photography? It translates as phobos graphis, drawing or painting with light. Uh, Scott Robert Lim, one of our artisans, uh, has played around using a fork and the light from a smartphone to create some neat effects. Document your hobby. Maybe it's stamps, maybe it's coins, maybe it's those Funko Pops. Maybe it's you know, your action figures. You know, Whatever it is, have fun doing it. You know, start playing around with your lights, as you can see. Now, my boss, uh, Jeff, actually supplied these for me. So he was using one of the NAN lights, which are really, really cool, and just something he picked up at, like, Home Depot. And if you notice in the image is that you have a little bit different color look because one has one color temperature, the one doesn't. Well, yeah, that can be kind of distracting. So in a camera like this, which is basically black and white, you know what? Turn the image black and white. Color tint goes away. So you can do some cheating. Now, before we kind of finish up with the day, uh, let's go to lens adapters. You know, there's, I mentioned very early on, there are a bunch of lens adapters that are out there. You've got your Novaflex, you've got Metabones, you've got Photo Deox, you've got Sigma. Um, there are a bunch that are out there. Now, I do have to caution you, don't buy the cheapest thing you can find. I went through this a few years ago. Uh, before I joined Sony, I was adapting a yellow lens to a red body, and the adapter is really cheap. It took two people... Um, my Irish rage to get the lens off the camera uh, because it was just a cheap and I'd never do it again. So I, I've bought much better adapters. I'm a very big fan of Novaflex um, and I'll have Tej bring up full screen in just a second. But you know, 
different ones out there. Novaflex are probably the best ones that are made. Uh, they're not cheap. They're made by the Germans in Germany, which has the highest labor rates in the EU. And they typically run about 300 bucks, but they're like just heavily engineered and designed. They're really, really nice. Uh, you saw the Sigma MC11. That's my personal one. Uh, very affordable. It does a great job. Uh, Metabones has a very good reputation in the industry too. Now I have not personally worked with them, so I can't say yay or nay on how well they really work. I bought the Sigma because I had a chance to try it out. It did everything I needed to do and it was uh, more cost effective than the Metabones ones, which it can be kind of expensive, but they do have some cool stuff too. Uh, plus too with the Sigma, you can do firmware updates yourself, you know, end user firmware updates. It's, it's really simple and easy to do. And just to show lens adaptability, my boss Jeff sent me this one too, where he picked up a Mamiya 645 lens at a garage sale for like 80 bucks, bought the Photo Deox adapter and basically threw it on his A7S and he had to use the manual focus, uh, the focus peaking to do it, but it's usable. And the guys at PhotoDX uh, had a real cool one where they actually turned a full frame or a crop sensor camera into a bellows series. This is actually at their website on how to do this. And I'm looking for an old ones like that to be able to have something on display. Uh, it's just one of the coolest things. But uh, before we go into some questions, hey, Teej, can you uh, put me full screen real quick? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So I kind of showed this a little bit earlier. So this is actually a Hasselblad 150 lens F4 on an A7 III using a photo deox adapter. So the lens is kind of heavy, so it actually has a tripod adapter with a uh, Arca Swiss. So all the weight is now a better balance. Now I do have to use the focus peaking uh, to make sure I get my focus, but it's fun where I can adapt old school lenses. The other one I, I didn't put on, but I did show TJ this one a little earlier is this is an eight millimeter Nikon F8. This has the NovaFlex adapter on it. So we'll see how many people get the reference. Sorry, Dave, I can't do that. Yes, this was actually the lens that was used in 2001 A Space Odyssey for basically the eye of Hal. But it is eight millimeter. It's that fish eye effect, so you get that globe and the depth of field is, is unreal. And now I can use this on my Sony. Every now and then I will bring this out to a demo to show people because they just want to see how it looks. Um, and when it was on the film days, you used to have to use it with this adapter. Um, little viewfinder adapter, but with, you know, mirrorless cameras, I can see exactly what I'm getting right away because I do have that live view effect. So since we've got a couple minutes left, and I, I ran a little bit tighter on this one than I wanted to, and I apologize, Teej, for that. So do we have any questions that anybody's got? I don't see any trickling in right now, but as I go through a couple of my slides, maybe some questions will come in. So first and foremost, thank you for joining Bear. I appreciate it. Bear's gonna hang out for a little bit longer just to see if any other questions came in. So I wanted to let you guys know uh, that we do have Pixel Photo Fest right around the corner. Uh, so August 14th through 16th, 2020, um, it's gonna be a hands-on, it will be hands-on, um, it's probably the best uh, value that you have in the photography industry. And we have some of the top talent coming from all over the US. So we're gonna be announcing more. I know I keep saying this, but it's just a matter of getting the time to get it posted. Uh, we have five more speakers that we're announcing very soon. Uh, our first five are at the top of their gang in game. And you've actually met quite a few of them so far. So if you actually use the code lunch and learn, you will save a hundred dollars, which is half off your admission fee. This week, we do have a contest inspired by uh, Bear's presentation here for lenses. We want to see your favorite lens. And this could be either a photo of your favorite lens or something that you have shot with your favorite lens. You know, these themes for the weekly contests are, you know, up to you to get creative with. So all you have to do is follow us on Instagram at the.pixel.connection and then share your entry with hashtag the pixel connection and hashtag my lens. So that way I know uh, which ones are part of the, um, this week's presentation or this week's, um, competition and I want to be able to find all of it across all platforms. So that's why we ask you to use the hashtag. Also, I want to let you know that we're doing 20% off all think tank and mind shift bags. Uh, you can find all of those on our website. Uh, so please, if you are looking for, you know, a new bag, take a look at this. That's a huge savings, 20% off on some of those bags. That's like a hundred bucks. 
So um, I also want to let you know that we are um, working with Sigma to raise money for local food banks. So 5% of every lens purchase will go towards the Cleveland Food Bank. So if you've been thinking about a lens or you want to pick up that adapter that Bear is talking about, now's the time to do it because you can you know, get that lens for you, but then also help people in need. I also want to let you know about a our virtual one-on-one -on -one classes. So um, if you did want to sit down and go through, you know, how to use a certain feature on your camera, maybe you want to do some time lapses with your camera, whatever that might be, you know, you want to get into video, reach out to us. We do these one-on-ones and they've been really successful so far where we actually sit down with you and go over everything just like you're right next to us. Obviously with social distancing, you can't, but we are doing these virtual. So if this is something that interests you, you know, you want to finally conquer, you know, whatever it is, we are here to help you as well. So today we talked a little bit about what lens I should buy. Tomorrow we're going to talk to our local friend uh, and photographer, Sarah Burney, and she's going to be talking about showing up uh, during this time. So how can you show up for your clients uh, during the pandemic and, you know, keep kind of front of mind with them? On Wednesday, we're going to work with Lumix and explain why your video sucks. Uh, that's kind of a harsh title for uh, really... Just how can you improve? How can you be a better filmmaker? And how can you kind of circumvent those mistakes that, you know, we see a lot of beginning filmmakers uh, do or commit, if you will. Moving on from there, on Thursday, we're going to have a light lunch with Profoto where we talk all about lighting. Friday will be the Friday Focus where I announce our contest winner. And then on Monday, we have Chris from Fuji, and he's going to be talking about landscape. He is a phenomenal landscape shooter. So I definitely urge you to, if you are into landscapes or want to get into it, um, definitely stop by for that presentation. And then finally, it doesn't look like there are any questions. So if you do need anything from us, please let us know. Our email is sales or social at thepixelconnection.com on Instagram, the.pixelconnection, or just give us a phone a call. We're here at the store every day from one to five, except for Sundays. So thank you, Bear, so much for joining. I had a good time learning about Thanks, all sir. the different Sony lenses. Um, if anybody needs anything from you, where can they find you? Where's the best way to follow along? I assume on these at Sony Alpha and at B Alpha. Yeah, those are the, the, the hashtags uh, that Sony's uh, popped up there. So it's a great way to kind of help showcase your stuff if you're working with uh, with Sony equipment. Um, you know, me personally, as I'm, you know, since I've been stuck at home, I've been starting to build a little more social media on my end of things because typically I'm like. Since it's time in front of a computer that I don't want to do, I want to be out photographing things. Uh, but right. yeah, definitely check out the Alpha Universe and the Sony Alpha sites. Uh, me, I'm just looking so forward to getting back out on the road and getting to see all these faces. You know, uh, I see like you know, like Nick and Brian and Karna uh, and Jim. You know, just I love being out there with seeing you guys. So you know, for me, it's like my actual Instagram handle is Sony by the Lake. Uh, which is at the time I only had a couple states and they surrounded the Great Lakes, but now I have six states. So uh, it, there's nothing really on there now, but it's about to blow up within probably the next few weeks with like tons of images that I've shot. So uh, I'm sorry that I photographed and created. <laughs> I'll, I'll get there one of these days. It's just decades of saying shooting. So, well, I look forward to following along on your adventures and I hope to see you in store very soon. Me too. my Thank friend. you guys so much for watching. We will see you tomorrow at noon. Have a good Take one. Take care, everyone.